Hello again, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us on this, our fourth uh, British Science Week public lecture. Um, hello to those of you who've returned from, um, have attended some of the previous one. Thank you for coming back. Hello to the new people who've just joined us. Um, in this session, we've got uh, the fantastic Professor Peter Clarkson, who is a professor of mathematics um, here at the University of Kent, who's going to talk to us about solitons, rogue waves, and tsunamis. Um, before, if you have any questions, anything you'd like to know, any questions, anything, please pop them in either the chat or the Q and A box that you'll see down below, and I will collate them and lose them to Professor Clarkson at the end of his talk. But for now, I'll hand you over to Peter. Please go. Ahead. Well, thank you, and thank you for this opportunity to give a talk in this British Science Week. I'm going to talk on three related topics of solitons, rogue waves, and tsunamis. And these are related to my research work that I've been doing over effectively all my research career. So first I'm going to give you a bit of history about the, the topic. It actually dates back to the 19th century to a Scottish engineer called John Scott Russell. And in 1834, he was riding his horse along the canal in Edinburgh. And what he saw was a barge going along the canal and it suddenly stopped, but not the water at the prow of the boat. Instead, he followed it on horseback and it maintained its height of about a foot to a foot and a half for a period of several miles until it lost it in the windings of the canal. He was fascinated by this because he was an, an engineer, he built ships, and he then did some experiments in a laboratory wave tank to, st to study this phenomenon. So he has this tank of water and effectively drops a brick in one end, and that generates a wave. And he was able to do measurements like this. He just observed that these solitary waves, which are waves of great permanent form, and he deduced they exist, which is probably his most significant result. He was also able to relate the speed of the propagation of the wave to the depth of the channel, and it's written by a formula that the wave speed squared is g times h plus u, where u is the amplitude of the wave and g is the force due to gravity. And we'll see this applies later in other phenomena. Now, I was lucky enough in 1995 to be part participate in a recreation of this original soliton. This was taken, or this happened at Harriet Watt University. This is the canal going past Harriet Watt University. And the canal there is going across the aqueduct over the Edinburgh bypass. And what happened was they had this small boat with various people in it, including one other member of the School of Mathematics. It came up to the entrance of the aqueduct and suddenly stopped. But what it did is then created this wave that went across and down the canal. It created a wave of great height. So I was participating in, in that. But let's go back to the history. The next people to make progress about this problem were Businesque and Raleigh. Scott Russell's results have been controversial. And they independently observed that the description of the solitary wave is of this particular form here. It's a function called C squared, which I'm going to explain on the next slide. So they're able to get the profile of the wave. And basically, a C squared wave, you can know it is C or C squared. Here is the formula for those mathematically aware of what it is. It just looks like a bell shaped wave. So it's a very classical shape of a wave that they wanted to, that they found existed. But the next major advance 
came with two Dutchmen, Kortevrek and de Vries. And they derived an equation governing long one-dimensional small longitude surface gravity waves in a shallow channel of water, just like on the canal. It, the equation they derived, which I've written here, the function u depends on both time and space. If this is called a nonlinear partial differential equation, but it's for those who it's, it's not particularly relevant. I'm just putting it down for those who understand. And you it was actually appeared first in the work of Businesque in the 19th century. But what they were also able to do was they were able to derive special solutions of this equation and two particular solutions. One which we now call a soliton, which has this sesh squared profile. And one thing which they called a conoidal wave, and it's a periodic wave. So it's a very particular type of periodic wave. Now, what you can see is that these waves do exist on the ocean. Here is a picture of, of a solitary wave. It's basically a long straight wave taken off Hawaii. And here's some more, another one taken off Hawaii where you've got this long straight wave. And you see another one in the background as well. So those are the soliton waves. But you can also get these periodic waves. Now this, from a relatively few photos of these, as you can see by the planes there, which at the time belonged to the US Air Force, so the US Army, the US Air Force didn't exist when this was taken. You can see these periodic waves in the ocean here. So these do exist. The next major breakthrough towards the mathematical theory came in the work of Fermi, Pastor, Ulam, and Sisingu. They were looking at a problem of having these springs attached of attaching um, weights between them. And then they set it off in a certain motion and they expect the motion to just dissipate. But it didn't. After a period of time, it just appeared to be exactly the same as what it had been originally. And it had this sort of periodic motion. Now, interesting thing about the paper that this was written was it says on quite clearly on the paper that the work was done by Fermi, Pasta, Ulam, and Tsingu. But well, the report is only credited to Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam. The next breakthrough was effected in 10 years later with the work of Zabuski and Kruschel, who were two American mathematicians. And they tried to understand the work of Fermi, Pasta, Ulam, to Singo. And they did it numerically. So and they actually took the, the quarter of de Vries equation and they started the motion off in this red line, which is a cosine. And then what happens after a certain period of time is you get the blue line. And normally you'd expect this to break, the waves to break, but it didn't. It then moved and had created, in this particular case, eight of these shapes. And as you continued it on, the, these waves interacted elastically. And here is another picture showing of how the progress of what you start with a cosine and you see it's a, it should break, but it doesn't, it creates a perfectly stable picture. And this is highly unusual in mathematics. So what they knew was that the Cartwright de Vries equation has this particular solution involved in this sesh that we have mentioned before. Now the point Important point here is the speed of the wave, which is 4k squared, is proportional to the amplitude, which is 2k squared. And so therefore what happens is that taller waves travel faster than shorter waves. In fact, the taller waves then catch up with shorter waves, interact elastically and emerge with their original shape. And you can see this in these three plots I've produced here. These are exact solutions. These are not 
produce numerically these exact solutions. You have the one solitoid we're just moving along. And you can see from these contour plots better what's happening in that you have the larger soliton catch up with a smaller one and then reappear. And if you have three of them in line, they just reappear in the order reverse. So you can get this phenomenon to kind of happen. And this is just a remarkable thing that only happens in certain equations. You can also get solutions looking like this, which I call an accelerating wave, whereby you have these curves. And again, they're, in, they're ordered in height. And these do arise in the ocean. Here's a picture of the solitons in the Straits of Gibraltar. And you can see these arcs of waves here and here as well. What's not obvious from this photo is that those waves are not waves on the surface of the ocean. They are waves that are called internal waves between different layers of the ocean, which is made up of different waters of different temperatures. And it's the, the sun highlighting them on different uh, these different levels you can get to see them. So these do exist. And you can see other kinds of internal solitons, what you would call, they're in the South China Sea. And these are off in the North Puget Sound. You can get to see. Now you can also get two dimensional. Everything I've spoken of to date has been one dimensional. You can get two dimensional. These are two dimensional mathematical wave solutions. You can see these two sort of waves that those are two like solitons and then they interact. And then you can have these that have these more hexagonal type of, of structures in here. Now the first one is a very famous photo by Terry Todmeister. He took it with the interaction of two waves in shallow water of the coast of Oregon. So very close to the, the mathematical model that we had. As for those other ones with the hexagonal pictures, here's an aerial photo of, of waves off the southern coast of Long Island. And you, again, you can see the hexagonal pictures here. And here's one that's closer to home, just on the other side of the channel in the north of France. And you can again see these, these structures here that have been created. It's normally weather that would actually create those kind of things to waves to actually happen. So these models do, are realistic. So what about rogue waves? Well, the rogue waves are isolated structures of unusually high amplitude. And this is a very famous woodcut by Pusoki. And you can see the Mount Fuji and this big wave here. Now, there'd been talk that sailors had said that they'd seen these waves and boats had disappeared. But it was a bit of a matter of folklore that people didn't really believe it. But the first real height measurement demonstrating these existed, this was taken on the 1st of January 1995, an oil rig of the North Sea of the coast of Norway. And you can see in the middle this big, large spike. And that was, that's the rogue wave, basically a huge wave that came over the oil rig. And this is a, there was a BBC, Horizon program on freak waves, it's another name for them. And this is a photo, of a recreation of a photo from them. You see how the wave is going to break over this boat. And here are some other photos showing these kind of freak waves. These are just waves that in the middle of the ocean just appear out of nowhere. They're just very isolated freak waves. Um, that you, so you can see that they, they are quite interesting phenomenon in their own right. People don't really know how they exist. There's various different theories about how they exist and trying to understand them. 
And here are some simple mathematical models created of these kind of rogue waves using equations equivalent to the non to the quarter vector Vs equation that I mentioned earlier. Since the role of the mathematician is to try and produce a model that's sufficiently complex that it models all the physics, but it's sufficiently simple that you can actually do something with it. And one of the advantages of using a model like the quarter vector Vries equation is that it is a very powerful mathematical model with lots of magical mathematical properties. And so you can actually do things and generate a lot of information with it. With it and you don't necessarily just have to use numerical algorithms to study it. Finally, if I move on to tsunamis, so these are big waves. They're quite different to um, rogue waves. Rogue waves are isolated waves. As you will see, tsunamis are a body of water that builds up as a consequence normally of an earthquake on the ocean floor. Now, if you're at the seaside, you notice the sea gradually withdrawing and the tide getting further and further away, further than ordinary times, we now know what to do, in particular after what happened in December 2004. You run like the clappers up the nearest hill or high ground if you can. As our, as our ancestors might have put it thousands of years ago, the sea god have breathed in and you better make yourself scarce before you breathe out again. So, if you look at the Indian Ocean tsunami that was off Sumatra, this is a diagram of what they worked out, what had happened to the ocean floor that created the tsunami. The blue part is where the depth of the water went down and the red is where it went up. So you can see that the earth, the floor of the ocean, part of it moved up and part of it moved down. And that's critical because you can understand mathematically what's gonna happen with the different waves. And what, why are you going to get them to happen? So where it happened, which is a, here, people in Indonesia had no chance at all because it, it rel arrived relatively quickly. It took, I think, around about five hours to get to India and about nine hours to get to Somalia. So they were able to effectively warned them, or they now can. There was an American um, early warning for tsunamis that's based in Hawaii that detected it in 2004, had worked out what happened to the ocean floor and could predict that uh, the tsunami was going to happen. Now, so tsunami waves do arise quite often from various sources, typically an earthquake. Serious ones, serious but being from the point of view of the loss of lives, take place relatively rarely. And I think many people became aware of the deadly tsunamis in December 2004, which was generated by the powerful earthquake of the Sumatra coast. And the challenge is to find a credible role that mathematicians can play in predicting their danger or in alleviating their impact. So what contributions could we make? Well, it'd be nice to know when an earthquake is going to happen. That's a grand challenge though, and not present within our reach. So what can mathematicians do? We can try and model tsunami wave generation and the propagation again across the oceans the design of early warning systems, and the clarification of the character of these tsunami waves. We can understand what kind of waves they are. So that's why we need to have a model that's sufficiently simple, that we can analyze mathematically, but sufficiently complex that it's realistic. And it turns out that the work of Scott Russell and those early work on solitons can actually give some information about this, as we shall see. So what actually happened? Well, before the earthquake, 
you have the oceanic plates. And then during the earthquakes, they move. And a fault can exist. And as I said, that part of the wave creates a trough and part creates a crest. So if you're going to get a trough, you'll get a dip before the, as a first part of the wave. And if you get a crest, you get a, a heightened wave as the first part of the wave that goes across. So that's, so it generates that. And it's knowledge of how that, the, the earth, the ocean plate has moved, tells you the shape of that wave. Then it travels in relatively deep water. Well, it's deep, it's in the ocean water, but as I will explain shortly, that's not actually that important. It's going at about 800 kilometers an hour, 500 miles an hour, and the wavelength is about 100 kilometers. Well, the height is not that big. It's only probably about 50 centimeters high. So it's a relatively low wave. Now, what happens as you go to shallow water, if you have the trough first, then as it goes to shallow water, the wave is going to slow down. So the, the, the front of the wave is slowing down, but the back is, getting, is still going at the same speed. So if we look at the, the, the dynamics of this, so this diagram is in imperial units. So it's, the height is about one to two feet. The wavelength, which is the wave between different, is about 50 miles. So in the Indian Ocean, the depth of the ocean is 2.5 miles. And that's going to give you, if you say g equals the square root of, a c equals the square root of g times h, a speed of 450 kilometers an hour. So what you have is that the, the waves here are, are traveling fast, but they're traveling slow as you get towards the, the shore. So in the open ocean, you've got a speed of 450 miles an hour. So a wave that's 50 miles long will pass by in seven minutes. And if the height is a foot and a foot and a half, 50 centimeters, then if you're in a boat there, you won't feel very much happening. But the power is in the wave that's in the actual ocean, not on the surface of the ocean, in the ocean itself. And as I explained, the front of the wave slows as it approaches the shore. The back of the wave is still in deep water. Hence, the wave compresses horizontally and grows vertically. So that's when it's going to get its height. And that's the danger of where it's going to go. To have, to have. So to summarize tsunamis, the water waves with horizontal scales much longer than the ocean, like tsunamis, travel with an approximate speed of, of the square root of g times h. Now, you could, in the Indian Ocean, even though it's an ocean you think with deep water, it is effectively traveling as though it is the model by the KDV equation, the, the quarter of degrees equation they had earlier. And so you can predict quite carefully exactly what's going to happen using that theory. The, the ocean, because of the large wavelength and the depth, is effectively like shallow water wave theory. So now, when you get close to the ocean, the shore, then that's not the case. And what we know is that the shape of the wave that reaches the shore depends upon one, how the earthquake changed the shape of the ocean floor and how far the tsunami has propagated. So that's all I have to say. I'll just close with a quotation that the mathematician plays a game in which he himself invents the rules while the physicist plays a game in which the rules are provided by nature. But as time goes on, it's increasingly evident that the rules which the mathematician finds interesting are the same as those which nature has chosen. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Peter. I'm clapping on behalf of the audience, but thank you very much for that. I also love your Zoom background, by the way, very relevant <laughs> to, to what you have here. Um, um, so if anyone has any questions, we have a couple of questions um, come in, but if anyone has any questions, please either pop them in the Q&A or the chat and I will pick them up. Um, a question that I, we have here already um, from right back at the start um, was about the waves that kind of these different layers of waves within the ocean. So not city on top, but kind of these things you showed crossing over, which is fascinating, I thought, as well. Um, the question was, can, is there anything that can be like inferred from these? So is there any correlation for that? Or do you know if there's a correlation between that and like kind of fishes and movement of fish or anything else like that? I don't know about the movement of fishes, but the those um, waves that go in as internal between the layers of the ocean can be very powerful and have been known to sink submarines. Wow. So they, they and they come about because of like different kind of because temperature differentials. It, it, it's a different temperature effect. You have the top of the ocean is relatively warm water, and lower down is much is much colder water, and they work like different layers of fluid, and you can then get these waves going along the interface of them. But you don't see them as such by having some kind of reflection of of the sunlight to do it. Yeah, sure, I see that, which was my, my next question was going to be around that, well, certainly with that and the potential impact is, um, is there any way of, like anything else, all of these predicting or monitoring this Earth observation to monitor that, particularly if they're going to have an impact? Well, yes, I mean, one of, I think it was the, one of the space shuttles, when it went up, it sent up, they asked the astronauts to actually look for these on the, on the ocean, right, on the ocean. You know, and they they didn't see them, so they have to send up a geophysicist to go. Whose her sole job on this uh, sh shuttle flight was to actually just look for these the, these waves. Now you do actually apparently see that um, those waves on the ocean, the surface of the ocean, but the bigger ones are the internal ones. So there are there are two. And the, 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 there was a study by Exxon in, I think, the 1970s, when they were surprised that their oil rigs were being turned every 12 hours, 30 some minutes, which is a tidal effect. And they found it was oh, the tides in the Andaman Sea that were generating these powerful waves that were turning the, um, the oil rigs by about well, quite a, a turn them around and it happened on such a regular basis and because of that time difference they said that has to be tidal and they worked out which tides have generated those kind of, of things that's very interesting and uh, the uh, coming out of that we have another question thank you for people who are putting these questions please keep them coming um around um actually because you, you showed you the data about the what i think you took called freak waves so these ones with the data from i think it was on an oil rig or something like that where there was that single peak um again the question i think and there's a theme in these questions is is there like um how obviously i'm sure people like exxon and people are interested in those is there any way of modeling a freak wave because a freak wave by its name at least implies that it is freak but is there any way of getting inferring from other environmental data or anything to predict um, them at all people have been trying to understand them as, as an obvious way that was the first time that they actually had some real evidence of it and they've actually done um various modeling to actually um i think if you go on to uh YouTube, you can actually find a reconstruction of the wave going over that oil rig. You can find some pretty scary videos on YouTube about freak waves where they're crashing over boats. All you can say is the camera survived. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> I like have that. no other proof of anything else. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so people have been trying to do it. There, there is a there's, there's two sets of theory about how they create. Either they're a combination of linear waves that add together to create something, or more likely they're going to be a combination of, of nonlinear waves that interchange um, energies between them, which 
and the theories of these soliton type equations which we have would actually model that completely and you try you're trying to do it but you're trying to get some all kinds of things i mean we're just trying to understand what's the models what we can do but also there's just a, a matter of what kind of these solutions we can actually find and we're fine i mean some of them that, that, that i showed of the plots were produced by one of my phd students who, who did who found a lot of very interesting solutions of these and these were not just doing it things numerically which is which is one way of doing it these are, are things where we we call them analytically where you can actually explicitly write formula down for what the wave actually is so you can actually get a, a better plot and a better understanding then of what's going to happen because you, what you're wanting to do is what happens over a long period of time what's going to happen to them trying to understand where they come from very good um coming out of that and um so question from david naylor who says um the he's noticed some pat some of the patterns that you showed some of the things you talked about the modeling and the photos they look similar to, you have kind of similar patterns in cloud formations. Does the same mass apply here or is it different? Uh, you can, there are some, I didn't show one, but there are some special um, waves of some cloud patterns in Northern Australia called atmospheric solitons and they're called morning glory, but they, um, and they're, they're long, um, like a tube of cloud that goes um, and, and, and like a, a long way. But you, you get, I don't think there's as much theory about doing them in, in the clouds. But there are some special, there are some special patterns. They also appear in um, fiber optics as well, where some things just happen and a wave just suddenly appears. It. It's a very dramatic sort of a cover of nature I think about 2007 that they were so surprised that they put a, a, one of the an optical fire, an optical road wave on the front, front of, of nature. Very good. That's very interesting. Of course, a nice link to a talk we had yesterday from Mike Hughes, who was talking, I believe he's in the audience actually, but I'm talking about fiber optics and some of those things around that as well. Um, another question we have here, actually from Mike, Michael Hughes, I assume it's it is the one, um, is can mathematical modeling of tsunamis help us to design better defenses against them and he's thinking vaguely about things like knowing the pressure distribution versus time or some other ways to just kind of dissipate the energy oh, well the japanese thought that they had uh, they knew um what to do and they designed their i mean they designed their sea defenses based on tsunamis of a certain height unfortunately they got a bigger one, and we know we know what happened there. I mean, that's it. But that they had worked out that they wanted a sea height of a certain height, but it, they just simply the location they come along, they're just too big. I mean, the one Is there that a... struck in sorry, go on. The one that struck in the Indian Ocean was certainly very high. That the, almost no sea defense would have created it. That they do have better warnings That's a, now because when that tsunami struck in 2004, the Americans knew, heard it, worked out what had happened, worked out what's going to dramatic was going to happen. But then they didn't know the phone numbers of the US embassies all over the Indian Ocean because it was a Pacific warning system. So they only had the, the, the Pacific nations to have phone numbers to happen. Because that was 2004. Wow. <laughs> that's inter very interesting. interesting i mean um, i was I, at the time in australia in in rural new south wales and i didn't hear about it for several days interesting um i guess building from that uh, a little bit um is yeah what where is the future for this i mean are we what are we lacking are we you you said and you showed you showed some images from some people in your team your phd students about modeling these things but how do we what what are we missing in order to move from kind of modeling to better applications to the real world what do we need what do you see in the next 30 years will change with this will computing make it better to be able to predict or create more complex models or do we need better data input in the first place I think there's getting more data 
but I mean, just to get the, the getting the better models to be able to solve them, yes. I mean, it is to try to get different kinds of phenomenon to understand. I mean, the kind of equations that I look at actually have some very deep mathematical, very interesting pure mathematical things that people would normally think of as possibly irrelevant. But there's such structures that, and they have that, that you can actually do a lot more with them. You can actually build up these, these kind of solutions in, in a lot more general way without necessarily having to go into just purely doing it numerically, which is a which has its limitations because effectively you have to guess what all the parameters are, what the values actually are. So it's it's a quite a difficult concept to do. Yeah, I understand that. Fantastic. Um, we've reached, I've reached the end of the questions that I, I've had in the chat and in the Q&A and directly to me. Um, so this is another time to say thank you very much, um, Professor Peter Clarkson. It was a fascinating talk. I mean, and we've had a couple of comments in the chat already saying this is fascinating. I completely agree. It's amazing to see that link between solitons and the mathematics behind it and the real impact in the real world and kind of bridging those things and trying to understand it. Um, Thank you very much. Um, we, for those of you in the audience who might want to attend future things, we have got more coming up in British Science Week. Um, and we have a roundtable to tomorrow as well with a number of our speakers coming back to discuss more about their visions of the future and looking a bit more, uh, thinking about innovation and how the links could be from across all of the disciplines that we've had giving our talks during British Science Week. Um, but for now, thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. And thank you again um, to Professor Clarkson, and we're getting some thank yous in the chat. So thank you very much and have a good evening, everyone. That's it. Bye bye.